I was thinking about decisions that I've made. So some years ago, I did a project that I wrote about and was in a film about called No Impact Man. It was a, about a year I spent with my family in New York living as environmentally as possible. And it was very, the rules that I set up for myself were very strong, um, but one of the rules was, was no flying. It was a, um, you know, flying can, causes a disproportionate impact for all of us, you know, but a, one long haul flight is about the equivalent of driving for a year. So flying is, in the environmental movement, flying is a little bit of a no brainer. So during No Impact Man, there was a huge amount of publicity and Oprah, not Oprah herself, but her producer called me up and asked me to go to Chicago to be on her show in the middle of the No Impact Man year. And to be on Oprah for an author is, you know, it's kind of like the final frontier. I decided there was no, I, I said, you can come to me if you like, but I can't get on an airplane. So that was one decision. On the other hand, I'm not no impact man anymore. And um, recently in August, there was an opportunity for me to take Bella swimming with dolphins in the Bahamas. And I decided to get on an airplane with her and take her to the Bahamas. And also, even more recently, um, my girlfriend was living down in Tulum for the next couple of months. So I flew down there to, to see her. She wanted me to come down and see her. So on the one hand, Oprah asks you to go and you say no. On the other hand, you wanna go see your girlfriend and you say yes, or I say yes to flying. How do I know which was right and which was wrong? When I was very young, I had a job interview. And the question was something like, a building is on fire, there's a man wearing a blue suit and a man is wearing a red suit. You can save one or the other, which do you, who do you save? Um, and I was like, well, who, I said to them, I said, who could more, uh, which one of them could more easily save themselves if I save the other one? Which one's weak, another one, which one's weaker? I save the weaker one. Is it like, we can't tell you that. And I, I asked more questions. And then finally I said, you know what? I'm not answering this question. This is, that's stupid. Anyway, I didn't get the job. And I didn't want the job, but, but they told me that, they told me that what they were looking for was the, able, the, the ability to just be decisive, just decide. Like when there's no criterion. Our practice is a lot about making the right decision, the only problem is that so often in life, it's not clear what the right decision is. Like you can go to the left or you could go to the right. Just thinking how confusing it all is. And I was thinking, um, I was thinking about our kangans. So it's great with our kangans because it's not like that. There is a right answer. At least that's the, that, you know, you go in, you say an answer to the teacher, that maybe they shake their head. Not correct, like this. Or another teacher, you go and you say an answer and they go, ha, 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 and they really laugh at you. <laughs> or whatever. But then one day you go in and they go, correct. And you're like, I got the right answer. In the Soto school, their answers to, this, to a lot of the same kongans are different than our answers. In our practice, we look for our correct situation, relationship, and function, right? There's a way in which we look for the right answer in the kongans that we do in the interview room, and we, we look for the correct answer for the interview for the, for, for the, to the kongans in our life, right? How can I help? That's our vow, right? So we trust that our vow will take us to an answer. And it's one thing to, it's one thing when you're practicing and looking for the correct answer, but sometimes whether you've gotten the correct answer or not is not so clear. I recently 
uh, moved upstate with uh, my daughter and my ex-wife. We moved up here for my daughter because we thought this school and this environment would be best for her. But we also knew that there was ways in which it would make her very sad to come here. So I wasn't sure. I didn't know for sure. And then sometimes my daughter will say, why did you bring me up here? I never wanted to be here. Sometimes she'll say, I really like it here. <laughs> but when she says, why did you bring me up here? I act as though I'm very sure. Is that the right thing to do sometimes? Or sometimes I say, I have doubts too. Sometimes my ex-wife has doubts. And then I, again, I might act as though I'm very sure, but I'm not very sure. I, I knew that I wanted to talk to these things and I got, I was writing, writing my notes and I got to this part and I was thinking, okay, so how do I cap all of this off? What's the point? And I thought I could say something like what uh, Mark Houghton, one of our Zen masters once said to me, he said, our practice is about becoming comfortable with not knowing. It's about becoming comfortable with the ambiguity of not knowing when a decision is right or wrong, not knowing, well, pretty much anything you know, existential ambiguity. I thought I could cap it off with that. But I thought, that seems too tidy. Sometimes I'm very, very confused. And I can, if I'm not careful, look around at the world around me and the people around me and become very, very angry with the decisions that they make and the things that they do. And I forget they don't have any fucking clue either. The only thing I can come away with confusion with is an understanding that we're all confused. It's not my confusion, it's our confusion. And maybe this vow that I have, how may I help? And this practice that I have that helps me to be a little bit less attached to my thoughts of confusion and not knowing and and, and being confused, maybe it allows me to move forward with a little bit more grace and ease. I have a friend who wrote a book, it's called, it's about meditation, it's called 10% Happier. He read somewhere that if you meditate, you'll be 10% happier. It's not very much. Maybe I have 10% more grace and ease than I did. And the point of it is, is that if I, if I do have 10% more grace and ease, or if I have 10% more grace and ease than people that don't practice, then that means my job is to treat them with grace and ease, even when I'm angry at them, to understand that I have all this confusion and I have a practice to deal with it and I'm still confused. I'd end with this. In the Tao Te Ching, it says, what is a good man but a bad man's teacher. What is a bad man, but a good man's student? Which are you? We'd like to have some authority over what the next thing is. Uh, but as you're demonstrating, uh, what we have the most authority is uh, what we're doing now. And there's a value in being able to be present and responsive for what happens after we do the thing that we're doing now. And maybe a question to rest with is, uh, what happens when I do this? Because you always get feedback about that. If you are concerned about making sure you've done the right thing and avoiding doing the wrong thing, uh, that's probably better most of the kind time than not really caring about whether you did the right thing or the wrong thing in the sense that at least uh, you have some standards for yourself. 
and wishing to refine your standards for yourself to live more wisely and compassionately and in better balance with the world is probably better than not caring about that at all. When that's your concern, you're living in inquiry. And inquiry always generates more information. And that kind of information maybe helps us develop a sensibility for ourselves about, do I go left or do I go right? 